Hello, Global Gardeners. Welcome to another Monday for a little bit of gardening talk where we can talk about what we're going to do the next week, what we accomplished last week, and what the season is going to bring. It's so great to see people from all over the world checking in. We have a great show today. I think you're really going to like it. Uh, let's go ahead and jump on just a couple things real quick while more people are checking in. Uh, Yankee Sista has snow in Connecticut. Much of the northeastern United States is under a blanket of snow right now. A lot of cold weather. I'm supposed to be around 60 degrees today Fahrenheit. That's about 15 degrees Celsius. But we have a complete change coming in a couple days as well. We're, we have snow forecast Wednesday into Thursday with temperatures well below freezing as high temperatures. So it's that ro roller coaster time of year as we begin February. And I know some of you want to be out gardening, but you have the snow in your garden right now. So hopefully it'll melt soon and we'll all get our seeds in the ground as soon as we can. Muffy 1981 was asking about um, some basic seed starting information lettuce sprouted up tall overnight under the lights and heat mats and so let me just talk a little bit about the concept behind heat mats because i also had some comments about heat man heat mats in my recent videos as well and so plants like lettuce are cool season plants or cool weather plants they like cooler conditions and so if you put plants like broccoli and lettuce and kale underneath lights on a heat mat they're going to germinate very very quickly and they're going to grow very quickly as well those type of plants really don't need heat mats because they're used to the cooler temperatures i like to reserve my heat mats for my peppers and my tomatoes and my eggplant and ground cherries the type of plants that are warm season plants that can really benefit from a warmer soil temperature when those seeds germinate so the reason you're probably seeing such great growth with your lettuce is because of the heat mat not so much the lights that soil is just so warm that those seeds are going to germinate very quickly and they're probably going to get pretty leggy if you don't keep them under the lights with the lights close to the plant so just want to throw that out at you um Lorenus, um jonica had a question about um potatoes i'm wondering if i'm going to do potatoes in or, or do a video about potatoes in raised beds and so uh, I am planning to do some of those videos. I'm going to be doing mostly um, videos on potato growing in grow bags, but I'm also going to show other variations to include raised beds. So look for that coming. And then one last thing here real quick before we get right into the show. I want to apologize to Jawala Prasad. Um, it looks like I missed your super chat last week. So thank you so much for that super chat early on the show. I missed it. And I just want to give the shout out right now and thank you for that. And so let's get on with the show. I've got the videos planned for my potato growing. But if you really want to learn about potatoes, then I suggest you watch the videos of my partner today. Tony O'Neill, in my opinion, has the best videos out there on how to grow potatoes. And the videos I'm making and all the potatoes I'm growing, I'm going to be using a lot of the methods that Tony has taught me. So welcome, Tony. It's great to have you here today. Hey, guys. How's everyone doing? Uh, so um, I'm warm. Much of the United States is snowy. What, what kind of are, are you still having all of the rains that you had last month? No, we had uh, quite a bad snow drop um, about a week ago. And then it snowed again yesterday, but we had rain this morning. So that's sort of washed all that away now. Um, okay. But we are having snow as well. So so this is a very wet time of year for you in England. Very. Yeah. Okay. Very wet. Interesting. Um, so one of the big things I want to talk about today and Tony wants to talk about is kids in the garden, getting the youth involved. Uh, both of us have done work at school gardens. Both of us have had children in our garden in different ways. And so uh, I, I asked Tony to come on. He had a, a video release 
uh, this last week. So Tony, why don't you tell everybody uh, what that video is about, talk about Lisa, and that'll be how we move into the discussion of kids in the garden. Sure. So um, just before December, I received a letter from an eight-year-old girl called Lisa and she challenged me to a pumpkin grow off and i just thought that was amazing the fact that this eight-year-old girl was growing anyway and that uh, she wanted to challenge somebody that she'd been watching on youtube now you know when you're on youtube and you make videos people tend to sort of like follow your journey and everything else and that's what lisa had been doing for the last two years or so with me and um and she felt now was the time to put this challenge forward and she wrote me a lovely letter and I contacted her parents and and spoke to Lisa and that's what that video was about and it, it was mainly to um, to highlight all the challenges that Lisa had faced throughout her eight years of life. Um, you know we're all sat at home moaning about what's going on in the world and how hard done by we are and everything else and this little girl has just gone through what I can only explain is hell. And and she still found all the positivity and she found medicine in gardening. And I thought that story just had to be told. So uh, hence the video. That's great. And um, I, I, I've seen that firsthand as well. When I was um, the master gardener at, at the Galileo Garden, uh, most of the students that were coming out to the garden every day we're the special needs students. Yeah. And, and I just remember so much. Uh, and, and, you know, it was, it was so rewarding for me to be working with these children who had challenges in everyday life. And then they'd come out to the garden and, and it's a different world. They could put all of their troubles behind. They had control over the plants that they were growing and the seeds that they were sowing. And, and it really was just a rejuvenation for them and for the plants. I, re I remember one boy um, on, the, on the autism spectrum, very disruptive in school, had a lot of problems. But when he came out to the garden, all he wanted to do was just sit by the little water fountain. I had a little solar water fountain. And it was a calming influence for him. And he could make it through the rest of the day just by spending a little bit of time in the garden. Yeah, and I've seen a similar thing. And I think what it is, is the inclusion that, that they feel when they're gardening, because uh, it doesn't matter about who you are in gardening. You all have that sort of common um, uh, theme, if you like, that, you know, everybody's got that common interest. And um, when I was speaking to Lisa's parents, Lisa finds it quite hard in school and things because um, people treat her differently and she doesn't feel included in everything else. And, and that is when you come to, to do gardening, you get lost in your own little world. And um, we've all done it. I use it myself as a medicinal thing so I can forget what I see at work. You know, you can put your head down, forget about everything that happens. And for that time you're in the garden, whether it's, you know, 20 minutes or five or six hours, the time just seems to disappear because you're not thinking about your troubles and stuff anymore. And that's what it does for children too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, uh, yeah, especially at a school, and, and I, I encourage any of you out there who might be associated with school gardens or you might know teachers, um, but it, it usually takes a teacher or a group of teachers to really make the difference. Uh, most of the time, kids don't know that gardening is even an option. But I would go to schools in our district with packages of seeds. Once a teacher expressed any type of interest at all, there's almost always some experienced gardener in every community who is willing to come to a classroom and talk about seeds and maybe hand out free packages like I used to do. And, and then it's so rewarding six months later to get letters from school kids that tell that they took the packages home and planted them and, and it's so wonderful. Have you, you, you tell us what, what you had done with the school um, gardens that you mentioned to me that you had worked with. Um, well, there's uh, one, and a 
half ago, I noticed a post on Facebook of a school in Norwich. Now, that's the other side of the UK. Um, it's probably around about four hours drive from me. And within that Facebook post, it stated about vandals had gone in. Now, this school was already forward thinking and they had their own garden. They'd spent what little money they had putting up a polytunnel and the kids were already started growing in it. And vandals got in and absolutely trashed the whole place. Uh, That's destroyed, destroyed all the plants, cut all the, poly, uh, the polythene on the uh, high tunnel, uh, just destroyed it. And obviously, you know, Scott, sometimes we can be quite influential with, um, with companies as well. And um, I contacted a few polytunnel companies uh, from the UK and said, look, I want to do something for this school to help them back on, the, on you know, into growing. And um, uh, I managed to get a company to provide me the plastic free of charge. Uh, I then got onto my own sponsor who provided me all the gardening equipment they needed. And then I got onto a plants place and I got a load of plants as well sorted. That's great. So, all of that went into the car and I spent four hours traveling up there and I spent the day with these children rebuilding their polytunnel, sorting out all of the uh, gardens, putting the plants in and helping them sowing seeds and stuff. And that was just like one example. But um, I, I believe that when you're able to, you should help these uh, children and communities and schools to get established so that somebody can then get out there and run with it afterwards uh, with your help like you know yeah absolutely and i'd like to uh thank grow shake for this super chat contribution um do you have any written plans a gardening space for kids with mobility challenges my son wants to create a few raised beds for his eagle scout project um i think that's a great question and, and though i don't have any written plans i do have some of my older videos i actually filmed at the galileo garden and uh, I, I talk about some of the challenges we had, and I do talk about some of the planning in some of my earlier videos. Um, and actually, I, in some of my more recent videos where I talk about putting raised beds in, I do mention mobility as an issue when you build your raised beds and when you decide how much space you have. So, so even though, no, I don't have a dedicated um, written plan, I have mentioned it. And the basic idea is um, you have to anticipate what the mobility limitations are. So for instance, we had a, a, a girl at, at the school who had a motorized wheelchair and, and she had some really devastating physical limitations. And she, she had to wear a helmet and she always traveled with an aid because of seizures that she would have. And so when, when we put the beds in, in one section of the garden, we specifically did not mulch the pathways. We left the pathways as firm soil so that her wheelchair could get up to the beds. Yeah. And then I put in some higher beds so that she could actually reach from her wheelchair into the beds to be able to, to sow seeds and, and do a little bit of work. And so it's completely doable um, once you understand what the limitations. So for an Eagle Scout project at the Galileo Garden, I had seven different Eagle Scouts do their projects in the garden. Um, and that's part of the discussion with the Scout and whoever's running the garden is to um, figure out what the, the special requirements are and what the needs are, but especially for mobility limited students I would suggest high beds and lots of space between the beds so that they can definitely get some work. Have, have you ever done anything like that, Tony, with working yeah, with um, disabled I designed, I designed a garden about six years ago for this very reason. I never, ever made a video on it because um, at the time there was some recording issues with um, getting permissions with the families and this, that, the other. So a video was never done. What I will say, if you're going to look at doing something like that, it's great having high beds because obviously wheelchair, you know, when they come in with a wheelchair and stuff, they can't bend down. But consider a standard bed would be around about four feet wide because we say you can reach into the middle of that. They can't do that on a four foot bed if they're in a wheelchair. 
if you're looking at making your beds like three foot or two and a half feet, that way they can manage it much easier. And keyhole beds are really good for this as well, where they can be wheeled right into the middle of the bed. And that way then they have like more or less sort of 360 uh, degree access around their chair. And I found those really good. But um, what I would say is, uh, Look for in the local communities for things like uh, secondhand paving slabs and things like that that will make good hard paths um, for these disabled gardens. And they need to be wide for wheelchair access because a lot of people will design a path that's the width of a wheelchair, but they don't then consider when the wheelchair has to turn or right. turn around a corner. So you need to make them a bit wider. But um, bring everything down to that sitting level and um and and uh, you know make sure that the sizes aren't too far that they can reach with one arm without having to lean and that will really make a big difference in those sorts of gardens yep absolutely um so let's let's change the pace a little bit um patrick kelly actually lives on the other side of the planet from us and he gets up or stays up extremely early and so it's actually 3 a.m in the morning for him and so I'll go ahead and show his question to talk about, um, are, are there two different types or varieties of fennel, one which grows a bush, which is mainly the, the herb, and one that grows um, the traditional bulb? And so have, um, I haven't grown a lot of fennel, but have you grown fennel? Yeah, bulb fennel we grow. Um, what we find is um, you guys tend to have a lot bushier varieties, uh, like Patrick's saying. Um, we tend to use just the tops of the bulb fennel if we want those sort of fronds, if you like, to, to use within the dishes. So uh, here we tend to grow just the bulb fennel. Okay, but, yeah, um, and, and that's mostly I, what, what I've grown. I know that there, there are different varieties, um, but that's mostly what I've seen in our gardens as well is, is the bulb fennel. But, but Patrick, there's definitely um, varieties out there. Anyone else that may have grown the different varieties, feel free to, to help out in the chat with your experiences with that as well. So I will mention, Tony, that, that <clears throat> there are a few comments, and I've seen it a little bit. You do have a little bit of buffering still, and so um, hopefully that won't be um, any worse as we move forward, but um, it, it looks, looks good thing. for now. <clears throat> And so um, Heidi's asking um, if you know, um, I don't know of any varieties off the top of my head for fennel. Um, do, do you have any particular varieties that, you know, as far as I'm concerned, fennel is pretty much fennel. Um, yeah. I, I know I've grown a couple different varieties, but it's not so memorable, but that I remember what they are. Homegrown seed tends to be better with fennel though. Um because it, it's, a, it's a little bit like parsnips where it doesn't store very well. So if you can save your own and, and use fresh seed, that'll be a lot more beneficial for you. And, and I've been seeing some good comments. Scott 3387, um, it, it talks about gardening with kids as well. Um, and it's not weed while they are around without explaining what you are doing. My two-year-old proudly presented me with four inch pea shoots and said weeds. Um, and, and that's actually, that, that's, a, that's a great story. I've had that happen as well um, in the garden and uh, particularly with students. Uh, you know, it's surprising, like kind of like you mentioned a, a little as, as well. There are so many youth today that have no idea about how to grow a seed. They, they don't have any understanding of it. And I think part of it deals with their parents not having an understanding of it as well. And I saw that in in the school garden where we would have a, um, a, a project often with weeds and uh, you, you just never knew. I had to, I actually learned the hard way when I was just starting out the, the school garden, just starting to build it. We didn't even have any of uh, uh, or I think we just had a handful of the raised beds. We ended up with 104 raised beds total. Um, but at the time, I think we only had 10 or 12, and I had a local group that wanted to do some volunteer activity come and ask what they could do as we were starting to build out this big school garden. And so weeding, of course, is at the top of the list, and I think we had 20 or 25 adults 
weeding. Now, at the time, we had virtually no money to build this school garden. And I was operating with a lot of donated plants. And so around our 42-foot dome greenhouse, I had put some young um, bushes and some shrubs that, that were going to, to fill the space around the greenhouse. <clears throat> and so I, I'm actually standing outside the greenhouse with those plants behind me as I'm explaining to these adults that we're going to pull the weeds. And I kind of did a sweeping motion and said, everything you see is a weed because we hadn't put anything in any of those beds yet. And at the end of the day, I came back as you know they were leaving and I was saying the goodbyes. And as I'm walking into the greenhouse, all of those donated bushes were gone. <laughs> the adults who, you know, who were trying to help had no experience in being able to differentiate between the, the small scraggly weeds and these perfectly planted small bushes that were by the greenhouse. So it's not just kids. There's a lot of adults that just don't have that experience either. Yeah, if you don't know, you don't know. Um, I remember when Wayne was just like a couple of years old and I filmed a video of planting all these tomatoes in the polytunnel, about 30 tomatoes or something. And I, I'd go out to do something else, change the battery on the camera or something like that. And the next minute, Wayne stood out the front with these two sort of tomatoes in his hand and he just pulled up and he thought that's what he had to do. Like, you know, and I went in there, they were just devastated a whole lot at start all over. Like, but he thought he was doing the right thing. And, that's right. But that's all part of learning, isn't it? Well, it is. And, and I try not to, you know, I, I didn't get angry because it is part of the learning. Yeah. Um, Jay Dixon and uh, yeah, I, I think you probably know Jay Dixon from yes, some yeah. comments on your channel. Um, this is a really good idea, and, and I would suggest this to anyone who wants to become a better gardener, is to get involved with your community gardens and um, do something like Jay is talking about, actually going through the garden to identify what the plants are. And you don't necessarily need to know the specific variety, what the cultivar is. There are a lot of people just that don't understand the difference between um, a carrot and a leek. And so um, I think that's a great idea, Jay, to, to go through. And uh, if you have knowledge that you can share with others, do it. And, and it doesn't have to be a community garden. It could be your own backyard with your neighbors. I've done that in the past as well. When, you know, give, give my neighbors a tour of the garden and explain what the plants are because they they often don't know. Scott, I don't know if your community gardens there have um, like our allotments, which are a community garden. Um, we have a set raised, a set number of raised beds where um, someone can come and just sort of hire that raised bed for the year, and they will then um, have sort of mentoring by people from from the gardens like myself or whatever, just saying, right, okay, this is how we sow these and then we'll be planting them out at this time uh this time we pop them on things like that just to help them get a start and then once they feel that they're ready then they can take over a bit more of a larger sort of area within the community garden you know um things like that are quite handy especially if people are new and we're finding a lot of uh people now getting more into growing their own vegetables and stuff especially with the climate that's been happening over the last couple of years you know yeah um, so are you familiar with the single seed challenge? Um, I, you were on brief, briefly last week, I think, when I was yeah. talking to Scott Head about that, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so this is a, a good comment from from Phil, and I saw a couple earlier comments as well. Um, I think this, it's a, a great idea to get kids involved in gardening using that single seed challenge idea where you can um, explain growing, get them out in the garden, and like... Um, Phil says it's like uh, a sports car engine. Um, I, th I think that's an inter interesting analogy, but um, if you can get kids involved, especially with something like this where it's a challenge, um, and you know, and that's like you said, you know, Lisa challenged you, and so to 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 have that challenge, I think a lot of kids like the idea of uh, 
challenging an adult and hopefully winning. So you're telling me, why don't you share with some of the viewers how Lisa approached the challenge with you and how she laid down some of the rules? Yeah, she has. Uh, she's she's laid down one rule and it's the biggest pumpkin. That's all she's interested in. She don't care what color it is, what shape it is. She has to have the biggest pumping, uh, pumpkin. And at the moment, the rest of the world is Team Lisa. So <laughs> I'm on a, a losing battle. <laughs> That's good. And and so um, just a little bit about pumpkins. Uh, you you grow a lot of huge vegetables and huge fruit. And I'm planning, um, I had a, a, a donation from a viewer of some giant pumpkin seeds. And so I've got a patch in my garden. I'll be growing, attempting to grow some giant pumpkins this year. And we'll be documenting that. I've only um, I got just up to um, 96 pounds, I think was the biggest pumpkin I grew at the school garden. But genetics are a big part of it. You, you they, really can't just grow a jack-o'-lantern pumpkin and water it and water it and water it and expect it's going to grow 300 pounds. Genetic, um, and, and so uh, have you been doing your own um, pollination to to develop your own giant pumpkin breeds? Yeah, no, um, not so much on the pumpkins. Um, I've got uh, some pumpkin seed out of some of the largest pumpkins in the world at home. Um, and two of those seed I sent to Lisa. But for me, um, one of the challenges that I've always been trying to do is beat the world record for the uh, largest marrow or zucchini, depending what you want to call it. Um, now, the largest I've grown so far is 131 pound in weight. Um, and um, uh, I've grown a 67 pound cabbage, which you'll see on my Facebook uh, profile picture. You know, I, I've grown lots of big veg. The seed is, and the genetic of the seed is like 95% of it. You need that. But then direct to get, that'll get you so far. But then it's your growing techniques from that point on and how you nurture that seed. And um, uh, you try all sorts of things, you know. Um, uh, but what you find is that people who have, uh, want to grow a big one and they have a standard seed but they don't understand what that seed requires they'll grow quite a big marrow or pumpkin or whatever it is but it wouldn't be nowhere near any of the record breakers because right. they just weren't able to put what's needed into that seedling for it to really go like you know um the other disadvantage i have over some people is i'm totally organic I don't use chemicals and uh, some of the world records are sort of grown on chemicals, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, and, and even more so now, uh, they tend to be using uh, a lot of um, aquaponics and things to grow the giants. Um, they'll, they'll sit them on a big barrel and they'll grow like a cabbage up to the top of this barrel. And it's all aquaponics below it. Um, and, or, you know, so there's just tons of chemicals put into that. And, uh, and I won't grow that way because it's not something that uh, interests me and I don't want to be polluting my soil either. So, but like I said, uh, every year I try with the, the, the zucchini, the cabbage, I've got cabbage seedlings in now, but I left it late this year. Now with some of them, uh, like cabbage, you'll be planting this year's cabbage last November, oh. maybe October, November, because it needs most of that winter to get go in and establish for it to produce a big head, which is what we require, you know? Okay. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of knowledge like that that makes the difference with them. But for me, I grow I grow to eat, right. first and foremost. But the, the, the giant stuff that I do grow besides is just me sort of trying to stretch my growing skills a little bit, you know? Yep, yep. It's enjoyable, and, and you've seen me encourage others to do that as well. <clears throat> Stretching and, outside your comfort zone to, to try those new things, experiment, learn. Um, you know, I was able to get almost to 100 pounds on a pumpkin and learned a whole bunch. And so this year I'm hoping to break 100 pounds, which is nowhere near record setting, but it's hugely educational when you take on a project like that and try to accomplish something you've never done before. It's 
beneficial as well because like all of those veg that I grow and you know they're huge as you can imagine but they're all, all like anybody thinks they would be and like the cabbage and uh, the marrows and everything I grow every year all go to a homeless shelter and they use those to feed the homeless so it's never wasted so um so I can still get the fun I want out of it and stretch my growing uh, things and then someone's benefiting with a meal at the end of it as well so it's never wasted and now with Lisa um you know Lisa's gonna um grow a huge pumpkin this year and I plan on getting her to um use it for her photographs and everything else that she wants to do and then I'm going to see whether or not they can donate it for a good cause somewhere else because that will also help me say to to pay it forward a little bit you know nice nice so Huckleberry finished is asking a question about um, seedlings. Now I'm not sure, and and I'll ask you here in just a second. But I use a lot of the 72 cell trays for to start my seeds, and I I typically use my own um, mix, seed starter mix. And so the question is about um, it falling apart when you try to get it out. Now. Uh, I, th I think a key difference is that a seed starter mix tends to be either peat based or cocoa core based. Once the roots start growing in it, I, I rarely have an issue with the soil falling apart because that, that seed starter mix tends to bind with itself once it's moist and then the roots hold together. If you're using a potting soil blend that, that might have um, some chunky compost or more perlite or something in it. I've had some issues with potting soils falling apart, um, but I th I think for the most part, if if you're trying to take a plant out of the cell and the soil falls apart, that's showing you you're probably doing it too early. There's not enough root development. I I'd like to wait till the second set of true leaves start developing before I'll take them out of those those smaller cells. So. Um, do you do it? Is it similar, or do you do it any yeah. differently? I mean, planting in um, in a cell, you know, it's um, the idea of that is to give you or give that plant the time to establish that root system. Now, I've got some chilies just starting in cells just down on the, the floor below me now. And I'll pull one up now to show you in a second. Um, but when people are, are trying to take that plant out. If that root system should really have it should be like a net around the soil yeah. and they're pulling it way too early and they're finding that the roots have only probably penetrated like half of the compost within the cell so it hasn't had a chance to bind together if you're pulling that out and it's leaving part of the compost in and it's not coming out in the shape of the cell then you've pulled it way too early um scott i'll bend down by you a moment i'll pull this up okay. and i'll just show Okay, so while he's pulling that up, uh, Monica's asking, what type of garden is best when gardening on a mountain? And so uh, I, I've grown in the mountains before. I tend to like raised beds and terraced beds, depending on the slope of the, of the garden. But um, for growing on a mountain, uh, one of the reasons I like the raised beds living in the mountains where we have some extreme weather conditions I just find it's easier to put hoops over the beds and to put that protective layer for the weather when the beds are raised. So the, those are what I typically prefer. And you're probably going to be growing a lot more cool season plants than warm season plants. Um, but try a little bit of everything, Monica, and see what works best for you. So, okay, Tony, back to you. Show us what you pulled okay. up. So I don't know how well he's going to come out on the camera because of the lighting and I've got a green screen behind me and he's green. <laughs> so um, essentially, as you can see on the bottom of these, I yeah. don't know if see it there. Yeah, okay. the roots are starting to come out. So, yeah, but you can push through a pencil through there, which will help lift first because they're quite large holes. But the important part about about these now, now these are just hitting their, true, their first true set of leaves, okay? But this plant has nowhere near gone through that compost within there yet. And it will probably come out with its second set of true leaves. And by that point, I'll be able to pull these and pot them on. Um, it's different if you're planting into 
uh, a small uh, tray of compost, you know, not right. cells, because then you need to transplant them. But the plant more feed and nourishment and soil so that it can get to a good size before you need to pot it on. Things like peppers, I, I said in a recent video, they don't like their roots being disturbed too much. So you need to leave them in here to get a really good established root system, then pot them on. They, they'll do much better as plants. Um, I didn't think that when I lifted these up that the green screen was behind me. But um, yes, you know, it's a case of, um, you know, don't don't be too quick to pull them out the cells. That cell is going to provide that plant with loads of nourishment for quite some time, especially as a seedling base. Yeah, and I like to use a tool um, that's about the size of the cell to try to help lift it out as much as possible. I like the um, the tongue depressors that you that you get in hospital. You know the the it, it's like a popsicle stick, but it's thicker and with the cells i use i can i can put that tongue depressor tongue depressor in it's flat and then it's just a, a lever to just pop this the soil and the plant out um, and and i find that's also a good way so you've got the roots up to the second two, set of true leaves and then you use some type of tool to cradle all of that soil and plant out and i i rarely have a problem with the soil disappearing one thing I will say about um, the cheaper forms of cells, you know, the really thin plastic, um, because they don't, because they're thin, they can't have a hole in the bottom of them. They just have little perforations. And the problem that you have then is you've got to squeeze the root system to get them out of the cell. And that's never good for that root yeah, system. Yeah, so, I don't like that um, either. Invest in proper cell trees, guys, because I tell you, it'll make your gardening so much easier. You'll have much more healthy and robust plants coming out of it because you haven't damaged that root system that's still really fragile at that age. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you, Muffy1981, for that super sticker. I appreciate it. I'm glad to have you here and, and benefiting from the two of us talking. Um, Rob is actually um, hi, relatively Will. near you, I believe. I think he's in Wales as well. He says, hi, Tony. Uh, he's one of the regular viewers here, so it's always nice to see him. Um, so it's it's one of those things. I, I also want to talk a little bit more about um, get, getting kids in the garden because uh, I, I I haven't seen you do it. Scott Head has a, a couple recent videos where he has his son now in the garden working with him. And so um, I... I really got into gardening after my kids were entering their teenage years and they weren't interested in the work that was involved and I, I couldn't get them as motivated. Now that they're adults, they're getting more and more interested in gardening. But how about your family? How how much help do you get on your allotment? I know, um, or at least I haven't seen much of that in your videos. Yeah, in my older videos, they were at the, the garden all the time. And um, a couple of years ago, uh, YouTube caused a few issues, as we know, with uh, children being in videos and you having to allocate them. And I did a couple of videos around that time and they demonetized everything. And they actually turned around and they removed like five or six videos. So at that point, um, I didn't uh, have them in the videos because obviously they were not 13 years old. Now, funny enough, my next video, which is a compost video, Caitlin's in that, helping me to uh, empty one of the compost bays. Um, but, um, but as a rule now as well, because the way I structure my videos now, you know, I could be all day filming just that video and I'm not really doing any gardening. So the children will come to the garden with me the rest of the week type of thing. But when I'm filming, it doesn't tend to have them in it because you know it, i might be there all day just filming and saying the same like one paragraph over and over and over again and they get bored with that pretty quickly yeah. i can tell you so um but um no um i got some b-roll with caitlin in and helping me to empty one of the okay. bays and i'll be in the next sort of episode so uh that'd be good 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 and Chris is asking about the green stuff that's growing in in the the seedling tray 
Um, this is pretty common. It, it happens to me all the time, especially if you're using peat moss, because the peat comes from a bog, and if you let your sard, your seed starter mix get too wet, you'll have some of that algae and moss start to grow. You got any tips? I, I, I just let it grow. It's not that big an issue for me. It just means I need to yeah, let the surface dry out a little bit, that it's probably getting too wet. Yeah, people tend to overwater seedlings way too much, um, especially with uh, seed. If, you, um, if you're going to plant seed, just water the compost first, loads, till it's soaked right through, and then plant your seedlings, and they shouldn't need watering again till way after they've germinated. Um, but if you want to prevent that sort of green mold forming, and it's not going to hurt your plants anyway, um, but if you want to prevent that, bottom watering helps hugely with it um, because the moisture is coming from below and it tends to keep the top levels drier. Um, that, that is probably the best advice that I can give as far as that goes, but it's not going to affect you. What I will say is, though, if you are watering way too much and you are getting that green mould, you're watering too much, and you could cause a different issue called damp uh, you know, dampening off. So you've got to take that into consideration as well because that can cause some lead to some other issues you know yeah absolutely uh and and strong style organics is is saying that well and that's exactly what i do is bottom watering as well um it, it's just you're right M most gardeners all of us at some point or another um over water <clears throat> and the result is either green growing or the fungus gnats start coming in um, and just letting the top dry off can make a big difference. Yeah, massively. <clears throat> and so um, here's a question from PD. Um, do you recommend that you do so for about 20 to 25 minutes? So how, how do you actually approach the bottom watering to determine when you've done enough? Right. <clears throat> so when, um, when I water, I, in my last video before the pumpkin, when I did a, a seed starting video, and I showed him it. Um, I put all my, my trays into either tomato trays, you know, for tomato bags or something similar. And uh, in that, I will have um, some matting, okay, that will absorb water and release that another time. So I'll put maybe, you know, a sort of half inch of water in that tray. I'll allow that to be absorbed by the plants. If I don't see moisture at the surface of the plants at that point, sort of 10, 15 minutes later, I'll put another half inch in. What happens is eventually that will absorb to the surface. When you start seeing it appearing at the surface on most of the plants, then you know they've all had a good watering and you're not left with lots of water in the tray. But the matting, if, if you get like lots of surface water, you can pour that off. But um, the matting, what that does is it absorbs what water is there and then that wicks back up into the um, into the plants over the next day or two. So um, the, the matting is quite important. It's really good to use, you know. Yes, but I, I, I will say there was a, a little bit of a, um, comment. Uh, thread on the the Facebook group this morning, uh, and it, it raised an important question. So so yes, I have some matting. I do have some trays that I'm using the matting in. But if you are just starting the seeds for germination, yeah. if you put a heat mat underneath one of those type of trays with the wool or or the cotton or whatever the, the fabric is. You're not going to get that that heat radiating and uh, moving up to the soil. So I would yeah. recommend for the the chilies, the peppers. If you're going to use a heat mat, don't use one of those self wicking beds or one of those mat trays because the heat mat is is virtually worthless at that point. Well, I use. I'll show you what's down by here. Um, I don't know if you can see it down there. Um, that's uh, a propagator that's okay. got a heated base. OK, and um, that heated base. So all my plants that need germinating will go on, on to, into something similar like that. And it'll have light and heat there. But once they're at a certain level and they're able to, uh, you know, be out in 
standard atmosphere, if you like, whatever temperatures are in the greenhouse or the polytunnel or whatever it is, once they're okay to be out in that, then they go onto that matting in those trays. Right. They will go on it when I'm germinating them. Right. Yeah. And, and that's how I approach it too. It... Making my life easier later when I'm walking. Yeah. yeah. Now okay. I've got here these uh, these propagators I use over here in the store, uh, you know, in the studio because um, I can get them away from home, but I've got plenty of electrics here. And of course I've got the grow room for the, uh, house plants behind me as well, which I can, you know, I got lots of light and heat in. So it's ideal for me to germinate everything you're just put in the back of the van and then take it to the garden later. Okay, good. Good plan. As long as you have a system that works, keep doing it. Well, that's it, isn't it? <laughs> uh, so here's an interesting comment. And um, I'm, I'm planning on having some fun uh, with this. Uh, Mr. Texas Bones says, I helped make a fairy garden with my niece. Uh, I had to cut a large tree out of my front yard after, shortly after I moved in, and I left a big section of that stump with the intent that I'm going to turn that stump into a fairy town with little doorways and little windows, and I'm going to grow a, a fairy garden with all those little mosses and little plants around that, that tree. Awesome. So I, I think that's a great idea yeah. to, to get some younger kids really involved with the the garden as well. I know, I know you're focused primarily on food, but, but do you ever try any whimsical things like that? Yeah. Um, I've done things like for Christmas and what have you. I haven't done the fairy gardens. Um, it has, it has been something that I've done, but once you've got a channel that's quite established on one particular thing, uh, when you bring in other elements into it, they don't always gel very well. I found like with the, um, uh, with you know the house plants behind me, uh, I've been filming videos for those. I haven't released them yet because uh, that's something that's going to be coming very shortly. But um, uh, those sort of that will take time to gel across the sort of channel because um, what will happen is the people who are coming to me for vegetable gardening probably won't be interested in those. And then I'll have to gain a whole new subscriber base for the house plant side of things. And I find that similar with things like the, um, the fairy gardens or the Christmas wreath things I've done and stuff like that, you know? And, and Laura Fall is one of our resident jokesters, but um, I think she's lost her inner child because um, I think glitter is a seed and can grow unicorn. So if you believe, um, it could happen. So my guess is why Laurafol isn't able to grow unicorns from glitter. You just don't believe strong enough. Build it and they will come. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, you know, and, and that is fun. I, I remember doing that with, with my kids at different points and I have every intention of doing it with my, my granddaughters. Um, playing on their beliefs if they if they have something that they want to plant thinking that something will go from it grow from it uh well we can help that along so if they sprinkle some glitter and expect that it's going to grow some colorful beans you can have them over and they can sprinkle glitter and then when they leave we plant the bean seeds so that they can water it and see what grows and i, I think that's a another great way to get um particularly younger kids interested in the idea of gardening is just to play to some of their uh imagination to get things growing in the garden there's so many educational things you can do in the garden for children as well like building the pond so they can learn about all the wildlife and stuff around the pond and why it's important for the garden uh, building scarecrows like we were speaking about earlier on you know those those sorts of things i mean i built my scarecrow with my children in my backyard uh, back in 2012, you know, so that's like nine years ago. And they loved making that. Those sorts of projects are great. Building little bird boxes or hedgehog uh, boxes, things like that, you know. There's, there's so many little projects you can do for the garden that, that the children will love to do. And that all sort of encompasses that, why we do all of that then to help us grow the food, you know. And um, and they enjoy that because it's something that they can relate to. Yeah, and and this is actually um, I like this idea from Kevin. 
Um, I hadn't really even thought about it, <clears throat> but I have some pelleted seed as well. And depending on what the plant is, some of the pellet coating is purple, some is green, some is blue. Uh, so that could actually be a lot of fun with kids in the garden is use pelleted seed and they get to decide what colors they're planting to, to get the plant. Yeah. I like that idea. Yeah, that's what something I, I, say, I, though, I haven't is done the pelleted seed. Yeah, just be mindful. Some of the pelleted seed that have these colors on are they, you know, they are like a, a pesticide that they've been soaked in or, or coated with. Now, it could be that some of those are chemical based. So you need to really sort of check what you're buying first. You know, yeah, you that's a good point. Yeah. I, the pelleted seeds I use, it's a clay powder yeah. with yeah. no additives. And I completely agree. Um, there are a lot of pelleted seeds out there that are often distributed um, more towards ag to industrial agriculture. But uh, you, you're absolutely right. They, they could include um, pesticides, herbicides, who knows? You, anytime you do that, you should definitely check on it. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Um, Okay, let's see what else we have popping up. Um, there's some good discussion going back and forth um, on all of this as well. Um, as, and, you know, humor is important in the garden as always. Um, I, I think it's, it's fun. It's fun to have fun in the garden. And, and so if, if it becomes just a serious labor, uh, it, I don't think it's as enjoyable. Now, many people are growing purely for the purpose of food yeah. and it, it it isn't necessarily fun and and that's perfectly okay if you're trying to feed your family uh and you have another job it's it's a labor and sometimes it can't be fun but for the rest of us that do have a, a you know a little bit extra time or, or this different approach having some fun with the garden really can open your eyes like growing the world's largest zucchini i just think that's I, I, yeah. I have to imagine it's a lot of work, but you're having fun with it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, I put huge amounts of hours into my garden. I enjoy it. Okay. Um, but if you're not creating that fun element in your garden, you're never going to go there when the weather's poor, you, you know, you're feeling tired. You know, I, like I was at the garden today and I've just come off a 24-hour a sort of shift that you know when i was in work and i was covering somebody else and i went to the garden instead of going home to bed and now i'm here today so you know but you don't make the um you don't fulfill the tasks that need to be fulfilled to have the really nice garden later on in the year and all the produce that you've grown and you know because you you weren't enjoying it you know um and you've got to enjoy it to be able to get out there and get on with them tasks. And I think it's a mindset. If you if you think it's you know you're not enjoying it, you you're going to convince yourself that it's not fun, and you'll find reasons not to go. That's a good point. That's a really good point. Uh, and, and so if you're just joining us uh, late, and you don't know uh, who I'm talking to today. It's Tony O'Neill from the Simplify Gardening Channel uh, in Wales, England. And I incur, I, or actually it should be Wales, UK, right? Because yeah. England and Wales are kind of like where we have our states where they're different. So, yeah. so Wales is part of the UK, just like England is part of the UK. Do I have that understanding right? That's right, yeah. We are, okay. uh, England and Wales are like two separate countries, but they're joined, so yes. they're, they're, they're now so, state. Sorry, I misstated that at the beginning. Um, but, but you've got a great channel, um, Simplified Gardening lots of videos lots of experience and uh so that's why you're here today because we're sharing a lot of the information and the experience that we both have to help all the the viewers regular viewers new viewers viewers on replay and uh there's just so much good information that we have to to do and so um <clears throat> there you did kim yeah you made it so glad to have you here to enjoy both of us as we share some of the information and uh if if you like what you're seeing and great chance to show your support give a thumbs up uh watch my videos watch tony's videos um it's definitely something that that benefits our our channels as we move along we love doing this not only do i think you should have fun in the garden but you should try to have fun in life and we both 
enjoy making videos and sharing this information. So uh, there are times when it is work, but I think that's what comes through in our videos is that, that we really are passionate about what we're doing and why we're doing it. And it's just to help a lot of people. So you, I, I'm, I'm speaking for you, but, if you, if you, but you pretty you much feel the same, right? To... Yeah, you have to be passionate because if you're not, you, you'd stop. I mean, when you, when you take like a typical 10 minute video, um, might take you three days in total to, you know, write the script and do whatever research you need to do, uh, go and find the right day to film it all, get your B-roll together, come home, edit it. You know, it could be a three-day process and that's for a 10-minute video and then that video might go out and no one watches it. Right. <laughs> so if, um, you know, if, and you do get a lot of days like that, especially when the channel's first new, because it's taking YouTube time to find the channel and find the group of people that will suit that channel. And um, so when it's like that, a lot of people will quit. So you really have to enjoy what you're doing because if you don't enjoy, you'll never go through all of those hard times to get to a larger channel like you know Scott and I have now. Um, we've been through everything that all the new YouTube is going through now. It's just a matter of time. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, Jean-Pierre is, is from France, so it's good to have Jean-Pierre here today. Uh, yeah, I, I actually find, I think it, it can be misleading when, when people are watching our videos. Some of my videos that look like it's just me in front of the camera talking for 12 minutes, uh, it might take six hours or eight hours to shoot. Yeah. Because like you mentioned earlier, you. You know, I have very precise information that I want to convey, and there might be a, a four or five sentence section that I have to shoot 18 or 19 times to get it right. Welcome to my world. Yeah, and then you added it, and then you edit it all together. And some of these videos that look so simple actually take the longest to do. Yeah. Uh, when we're walking around our garden and demonstrating something, those actually tend to be relatively easy because you got one chance at it. You show how you are digging with a trowel and how you put the seeds in and it goes pretty quickly. But it's it's the narratives where we're conveying specific information that I find um, can be the hardest to to shoot and get right. What I will say, Scott, is you have it easy because you're in your own garden and no one's watching you. I mean, a community garden, they all think I'm nuts talking to myself because I'm saying the same thing over and over and over again. And I could be half an hour just getting a, a four sentence paragraph out, you know? And um, so, but like I said, and, and, and that's the biggest thing, you know, is you could be there all day just filming one video, but it's worth it. Yeah. Um, I enjoy doing it and I know you do too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and so here's a good question from Claudia, since we've been talking about seed trays and heat mats. Um, and and I, I know different gardeners approach this differently as far as when do you move them off of the heat mat? Uh, I had a problem last year and I've been trying to figure out how to work it into uh, a video, but I actually uh, was, was growing some peppers, some chilies and had them on the heat mat they had germinated, they were, were growing, they were just about to set their second set of leaves. And I was late getting down to water one day and, and the soil had dried up and, and I lost most of those plants. Because in my opinion, I left them on the heat mat too long. Once they were growing, they no longer needed the heat mat. And so the heat mat was, was counterproductive because it was causing the soil to dry out faster and these growing plants were using more water and so I, I just made a, the situation worse by keeping them on the mat so I, I try to use the heat mat for germination and then once the plants have started growing I'll, I'll move the heat mat to another flat to start some more seeds so how, how do you approach heat mats? And pretty much the same so um, I think what people use heat mats for is to try and get growth really quickly and that has two issues firstly um the plant thinks 
oh, I'm in the middle of summer, I need to grow and go to seed. And that's another thing the heat map can cause is plants to go to seed early. And it happens with onions if people put the onions on the, onto heat mats. Don't ever do that. Let right. them germinate in the cold. But this, the other thing you have is you've got this plant now wanting to push out all this growth. Usually, most people don't have enough light. So you get long, leggy plants that are searching for light. They've used all the energy they've got to try and get to this light. And again, they'll keel over. So germinate it till it's a good size, but uh, has nowhere near finished uh, filling the compost or anything in the cell, but get it off the heat as soon as you can, but make sure it's got plenty of light. That way you'll have short, sturdy plants and um, they will um, the root system will cool back down and the plant will slow down in its growth. So you're not getting the long, tall growth, which is not what you want anyway. And people are too quick to want to get these plants growing. Um, we are four, probably four months away from being able to plant out sure. um, for most of them. Chilies are a different matter. You need to get them going early. And some plants can go out earlier because they're frost tolerant. But as a rule, most of the plants can't go out till after the first frost, uh, last frost anyway. So you want to slow that growth down or you end up with huge plants and then they have issues being transplanted out because of root disturbance and um, a shock from the difference in temperature from the inside and the outside. Uh, so here's here's a good one. And this, this uh, I'm guessing you've had uh, some good experience with. I do most of my starts indoors. Um, I'll, I'll pot them up to indoors and then when they're ready to go outdoors, I'll harden them off. But because you're moving a lot of plants to your allotment, you're starting indoors, you're moving to your polytunnel, how do you approach this question from Teresa as far as um, moving them from inside out to a place that's, in, in, in her case, a garage, but like in your case to an allotment? How do you approach hard, hardening them off when you go from inside to um, some type of completely different environment. So I did cover this in the seed video that I've just spoken about, but essentially what you're doing is you need to bring that plant outside first off. So if you're going to say the, the polytunnel, you need to bring it to the polytunnel and then take it back to where it's normally. So like a couple of hours in whatever temperature. So say if I was moving from my polytunnel to outside, I would bring the plants from the polytunnel to outside for a couple of hours for a couple of days. And then I'd extend that period of, uh, of time that they're outside over maybe a week or two's duration. And eventually getting up to where they're outside all day and just coming in at night. And then eventually then I will put them out you know, at night time as well, and they can go out permanently. It's, it's a gradual um, effect. So you're only giving a couple of hours out. And again, with this, it's not into bright sunlight or, or whatever. You need to shade off that plant and keep it out of the winds and things like that. But bringing them in and out is giving it uh, a little bit like um, acclimatizing that plant, right. you know, so, so that it's getting used to this, but not all in one go. And it, that plant then builds up um, strengthening cells within the structures that um, allow it to sort of tolerate the cold better uh, and to stand up against the weather and the winds and things better. So it's probably like a two week process in all before, you know, I'll go out, but I'll start that process earlier. You know, so if I want to put out in the middle of May, the beginning of May, I'm starting to bring them out to the garden for a couple of hours, taking them back in. It's a bit of work, but when you do go to put your plants out, then there's no shock for them. They just they're just happy to have sure. more space to get their feet off, and you get longer, uh, much better growth when you first put them out, so they don't check, and that's quite important. And and it does make a difference as to how extreme the the conditions are. So um, moving to a garage or a greenhouse or straight straight outdoors, um, it, it it does matter how closely it it is to the initial growing stage. And so if you're if you're growing indoors and then you move into a garage that has the exact same conditions, you don't need to do any type of hardening off. But with an assumption that a polytunnel or a garage has got colder nights, 
um, it, it, it can be an important factor. So I completely agree with you that it should be a gradual process to get the best success. And then to this other question, do larger seedlings require less light? Um, and so I think it, it, it really depends on the plant, but do you adjust your lighting based on the size of the seedling? Yeah, so um, depending like the, the chilies here had um, to start with. I, I think you but, were buffering a little uh, bit, so over, you started like, talking about the chilies. Can you repeat what you were just saying? Yeah, so they had 18 hours of light just after germinating per day. And then I gradually reduced that down to standard daylight uh, hours. So um, and the reason that I give that light is to prevent them going leggy, okay? Because they're on the heat. So I want to make sure there's enough light there so that they're not stretching throughout the night time. So 18 hours for the first maybe week or so, and then I gradually reduce that so it'll be Oh, you know, for a couple of days, 17 hours, a couple of days, 16 hours, and I'll reduce it right way back down to whatever we're having at the moment, which is like eight or 10 hours of, of light time. Um, but as a rule, the larger the plant, they still, the light levels still need to be adequate, but they just don't need as much duration. You could bring that down. Right. Yeah. And, and I do the same thing. I'm usually, usually about 16 hours, um, occasionally 16 to 18 hours for the seedlings once they emerge to get that initial growth good strong close light to the plants um, and then i reduce that down to about 12 hours before um, i put them outside or if it's it I, I try to match the the light that i'm giving the plants to what they're going to be exposed to when i put them outside and so if i'm putting some of the the brassicas out early uh, and I'm, I'm only at 10 hours of daylight underneath hoops, um, then I'll actually decrease the amount of light to be closer to that 10 to 12 hours that they're going to be exposed to once I put them out underneath the, the hoops. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's similar to what I do. One thing I will say, uh, even after the hardening off process, it's always handy to have fleece at, at bay as well, just in case there's the odd night that it drops really low you can just put that little fleece blanket over them um that'll just help keep that temperature going because that makes a massive difference so we saw your little germination chamber and i know laurifil um has talked before and on some of my previous chats um using uh like a a, a cooler like a styrofoam cool, cooler or some type of uh germination chamber where you don't have to have a heat mat. And so I think this is good. A lot of people think, a lot of new gardeners think they have to buy these heat mats. Um, but you can create your own germination chamber even with just hot water to radiate some of the heat that these, these younger um, seeds and seedlings are, are going to need. So how did you- Units um, like more expensive. That unit there goes up like three three different heights so I can keep full length plants in it. It's really expensive. It's a well, 500 pounds worth. Oh, wow. But give me a second. Let me just grab something. What a lot of people will use here, I'm sure you guys have got underfloor heating at home. Okay. You know, sort of under tile or under laminate floor heating. It's just um, a foil blanket that goes underneath your, your flooring, yeah? If you run that through something like this, and all this is is a, a thermostatic control, so you can control the temperature, that this and that whole mat there, which is a two meter by three meter mat, would do huge amounts of seedlings, and it cost about thirty dollars, thirty thirty five dollars in total. Um, it was about twenty two pounds. But this and that mat so it's a real cheap way in which to do it and um you can control the temperature you want exactly with it and okay. because it's designed to go under floors you can just lay it down onto like a hardwood floor or something like that you're never going to have a problem with it um so that really reduces the costings down for uh people who can't afford the propagators and and things like that or have an entire room like i have there right. um you know they 
it's an ideal solution. But you do need this. You couldn't just go plugging that in um, into into like the plug socket and expect that you're not going to fry your seedlings because they get hot otherwise. But this will control that and prevent it from getting hot. Okay. And, yes, and so um, I think control is an important issue. Kimye is asking, can you put a tray in an oven with just the light on to germinate? When Would that be warm enough? And I think this is one of those situations where I don't know. How how hot does the oven get with just the the light on? And so as as we try to come up with some of these ideas for germinating, uh, I think control is important. You have to have a thermometer so you know if it's having any, any effect at all. And having a thermostat, like a system with yours, where you control is, is obviously ideal. Uh, but I'm not sure that um, like, an un, like an oven light would produce enough light or enough heat here's in a space like that. Here's my issue with something like an oven. There's no circulation in it. And that's going to create all sorts of molds and and and, and everything else. Um, I would stay away from something like that. You really need that air circulation um, to stop the seedlings when they germinate from damping off. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and Lori's asking about um, light on seedlings. Twenty thousand lumens. Um, wow, that's that's a big light. Uh, you've got some videos. I've got some videos. You, I think yours are a little more recent. Um, what is the lumen rating on your lights and how close do you put them to your plants? Um, right. So, uh, the lumens, uh, well, I work on Kelvin rather than lum lumens here. Okay. Now there are all sorts of lights. Now, if you look in the background behind me now over my right shoulder or left to you, I don't know what it is. Um, you can see the lights underneath the, um, trays there. Now they are running on 5,400 Kelvin. Okay. And it's not about um, how bright you can make the light, it's the quality of light. And um, so different plants require different things. Now, the ones above the plants that you can see just behind that side, up there, they are the spider farmer lights. Now, they are uh, what's known as purple. They have the red and the blue light built in as well. And you need that for a lot of um, uh, plants like you know, vegetables and things like that, or flowering plants. Um, so, but it's more on Kelvin. Now, I've got a video where where I went through how light is all explained with the spider farmer lights, and we measured out uh, the different light levels that you get within a set period, because light isn't the same. So you, you might have a 20,000 lumen light. That is right in the center, right underneath that light. But the more you lift that light, that light dissipates the further out it goes and everything else. So I explain that in the video. Um, but I, I, I always base mine around par levels and, and Kelvin and things because um, each plant requires different things. Um, having just really bright light can uh, fry the seedlings in the first place. Uh, it'll turn most of the leaves brown. Um, you know, it's important to get those correct. I don't tend to work off lumens. Yeah, that was my thought as well. I, I focus on on Kelvin's, um, you know, I think most of my lights are 5000 or 6000 Kelvin. Um, but that would be my my concern as well that if whatever the type of bulb, it's putting out 20,000 lumens, it's probably generating some heat. And so, you know, you and I both say, keep your lights close to your plants to make sure that they don't get leggy. You do need to anticipate what kind of light you're using. And if the light is producing a lot of heat because it's putting out so much light, then then you shouldn't have it close to your plants because it's going to, like you say, it's going to fry the plants. Yeah. And um, so I, I, I would suggest for someone who um, is not um, so sure about the lights, again, it, it's that control. Put your hand underneath the lights. If you, if you put your hand three inches below the light and it is hot to your hand, it's going to be hot to your your plants as well. The grow room that's behind me, um, there is no windows in that grow room. All of those plants are all living off artificial light. 
And most of those lights are little T5 or T8 style lights, which are LED, so there's no heat coming off them at all. And they're all based around the 5,400 uh, Kelvin. Um, and they're adequate for, for the green growth. But like I said, if you look, while the plant, all your vegetables are under the green growth, they'd be ideal. But once you start getting in to relaying on the fruiting and flowering phase of the plants, you need to go to that purple um, side of, of lighting. That, but by that point, we've got them outside anyway. Exactly. And, and I do have some blue lights and green lights for um, some of the herbs and perennial flowers that I'm growing to get bigger before I put outside. <clears throat> but most of my, my seedlings are going out before I need to worry about blue and, and red lights. It's just to get them started and big enough to, to transplant out. Um, and Kevin raises yeah. the, the same point um, that if you're, if you've got, he's got a 9,000 lumen with 5.5 Kelvin. Um, That's the same. To figure out the That's distance. <clears throat> and he's figured out 75% and eight inches, which I think is great. That, yeah. You probably had to burn some plants to figure that out. But once you figure it out, now you know for the future. If you really want to understand lighting and its effects on the plant's canopy and everything else, you need what's known as a quantum parameter. And that was what I used in the video uh, when I did the spider farmer one. Now, the spider farmer, like Kevin's um, uh, one, um, is around 9,000 lumens. But like I said, I don't use that. It's not a reliable source. Um, but by having a quantum parameter, you can put that right at the canopy's level and you can see the exact amount of light. And this allows you to higher or lower that light to exactly what you require for that plant. Um, it's a great way, and it's what I've set up this back room on. I use that quantum parameter to make sure I was getting adequate levels of light everywhere. Good, <clears throat> good. Um, so let's go ahead, let's just finish up here. Um, we started by talking about Lisa and her challenge to you to grow the biggest pumpkin. Um, what's the biggest challenge for you as you approach that challenge uh, in, in, in competing with a child in the garden, how, how would you encourage others to make it a friendly competition? <laughs> yeah, um, you know, look, I'm, I, I'd love Lisa to absolutely kick my backside in this um, competition because she so deserves it and but i'm not going to make it easy on her because otherwise there is nothing for her to feel proud of she needs to 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 earn that and um i i have no doubt at all that she's capable of doing that and she's going to have some great help with her parents and i'm going to be advising her all the way through as well to make sure she's but the first thing she's got is the right seed and that was why i sent that seed to her um but for me, the whole challenge is all about empowering Lisa and to give her that uh, belief that she can do anything she wants to uh, while using the garden, you know, and um, she's overcome so much stuff in her life that she doesn't need me to tell her that because she's done it herself. But um, having someone to just sort of encourage her in the garden that she looks up to to some extent um i think you know we should all be doing it and if i can do anything that helps lisa to sort of really ingrain that gardening into her so that it becomes a life skill then i'm gonna do it that's great that's great um and and i i completely agree with you i think i think you said it very well empowering the youth to to want to garden and to want to have success with it. I, I think that's that's great. Just have to nurture it. When they show that interest, you just have to show them why they had that interest in the first place and keep that going forward, you know? That's great. Well, Tony, thanks so much for joining me today. I know, I know we had lots of gardeners from around the world appreciate your wonderful information and, and the time you shared with us. And I have no doubt this won't be the last. It's always good to have you on. But thanks so much for sharing your time with us today. Thank you. Great. And it's been great to see everybody as well. Thanks, guys. That's good. So we'll see you again. And as always, um, I, I want to encourage you to get to Tony's channel, Simplify Gardening, and you'll have lots of great information there. So, Tony, I hope you have a great gardening week. I hope the rains and the snows let up as soon as possible for you.
Have a great day, guys, and I'll okay. uh, see you all shortly. Bye. Bye bye. Okay, so let's go ahead and um, get to that point in the show where where I share some of my thoughts about gardening. <clears throat> Last week, I I talked about looking at gardening through the eyes of a child, and so as you pick your seeds and you put pick your plants, bring out that inner child and and have fun with gardening. And so Tony ended there with some great thoughts about children in the garden. And that's what I want to talk about today, where you actually garden with children and try to get children encouraged about gardening. Because as, as I shared some of my thoughts earlier when I was at the school garden, there are just so many kids and too many adults who know virtually nothing about gardening. But when you can get the kids exposed, you really can develop a lifelong interest in gardening, which, which I think all of us should attain. Many of us don't get to that point until we're in maybe our fourth or fifth or sixth decade of life. But if we can start it early, now all this joy that we are having with gardening can be started so much earlier. I remember, and this is one of my favorite stories to tell, <clears throat> in the school garden, had uh, a couple girls in particular, they were probably 12 years old, and we were harvesting much of what we were growing. A lot of the veg, some of the, the fruits were hadn't come in yet. And these two girls in particular were harvesting carrots. And so they were pulling the carrots out of the bed, and the one girl looked at the carrot and in all honesty and seriousness said, I, I didn't know carrots grew in the ground. She was fascinated by the idea that this carrot, this root that she had eaten came from the ground. I'm guessing she probably thought it grew like an apple where you pick carrots off of a tree. And that, that sounds a bit humorous, but but for a child who has never been in a garden and never been exposed to how a carrot grows, it, it's a, it's a life-changing experience. So she was carrying around the carrots, fascinated by how they had grown in the ground and she had harvested them. And the second girl, her friend, while we're having this discussion, is chewing on a carrot. She's holding it like Bugs Bunny and chewing on the carrot. And she says to me, I hate carrots. And then she takes another bite. But I'll eat this forever. And that is a, another fascinating aspect. If you've got kids and you can't get them to eat their vegetables, well, if they grow their own vegetables, they'll eat them. When they pull a carrot out of the ground and wash it off, they'll eat it right there. I've seen it in the hundreds of kids at the school garden. I've seen it in my own granddaughters. When we're out in the garden and we harvest anything that's edible, they'll eat it. And of course, wash it off first, but that's part of the fun is it, it builds anticipation where you say, yes, you can eat this. And then they're ready to eat it and say, no, wash it. And so then they wash it and they're just chomping at the bit to eat whatever it is. And then they love it. Now, it might not be something they eat a second time because not all vegetables are loved by all kids, but they'll at least try it the first time. And they may love it. My granddaughters love the peas. They love to go out and I've got peas growing everywhere for the purpose of them just pulling a pea off the plant and eating a fresh pea. And those sweet peas that you pull off the plant are, are better five seconds after you pluck them than when you pull them out of the freezer. So get your kids out in the garden. Get your grandkids out in the garden. Get your neighbor kids involved in the gardening as well. <clears throat> They're going to benefit but you are going to benefit more because I know from practical experience, I am passionate about gardening, but I'm more passionate about getting kids involved with gardening. And when I see them with the same developing passion 
it just is so heartwarming and it just means all of my efforts have really been put into place for a very good purpose they will carry forward into the future and hopefully at some point they'll be sharing all of the skills that they've learned with their kids and their grandkids and so long after we're gone we can have a huge impact on the future generations just by getting kids out in the garden right now and so think about that think about how you can have an impact on someone else's life a youth that is being exposed to your garden and what you can teach. And you don't have to be an experienced old gardener. You can be a brand new gardener. And I know many of you, this is your first year gardening. You can do this in your first year. As you're learning to garden, do it with someone else by your side who can be learning. And if that someone else is a six, seven, eight, 12 year old child, well, they have that same fascination that you will have as you learn how to garden the right way and most effectively. So uh, I, I just, I think it's such a big deal. I just have, I have so many wonderful experiences and stories from the kids at the school garden and now the new developing with my own granddaughters in the garden and even seeing my adult daughter in the garden and my adult son who has expressed interest in gardening. It, it just is so nice to see this because you all know how I feel about gardening and how excited I am to get outside and how passionate I am and to see that spread to others that I love. Uh, it's just, it just few things can be more rewarding and more enjoyable. So <clears throat> those are the words I wanted to share with you this week and pair them up with what we talked about last week. Look through the eyes of a child as you garden. And now when you get those kids out in the garden, don't stop that. Continue to see what they're seeing. If they're focused on something, well, take the time to see what they're focused on. It might be an insect. It might be uh, something that happened to the plant that they're wondering about. And so don't feel like you have to be the teacher when you have a kid in the garden, don't think that you always have to be showing how to do something and telling how to do something. Go ahead, go ahead and stop occasionally and look at the garden from the perspective of the youth. What is it they're seeing? And by stopping and looking at the garden through their eyes while you're both side by side, you'll begin to see things in a new light as well because they'll see things that you don't see. And it's just yet another experience for you to learn something new because maybe you had never noticed that particular plant or that type of insect or whatever it is they're seeing. They're gonna see things you won't even imagine until you take the time to have a joint experience with you and them on this journey together both learning, both teaching each other, because believe me, I've learned a lot from 12 year old girls who knew nothing about gardening. So put that in your bag of tricks. I'm pretty sure it will help make you a better gardener. At the least, you're having an impact on someone else's life, which I think can be so important in life around us, not just gardening, but as we approach everyday life. Gardening is just one way that we can really enjoy it and have an impact for the future. Just our planet alone, if you can imagine if all of us were growing some of our own food, what a better place it would be. And I encourage you to, to move forward with some of that. So hope that helps. Hope as you move forward that you have a great gardening week. Those of you that have snow right now, those of you with snow on the way, or those of you where it's four o'clock in the morning in Australia and you're going to go out into your garden because it's nice and warm and it's the middle of summer. Wherever you're gardening, make it a good week. Have fun in the garden, but above all, enjoy gardening. I'm Gardener Scott. I'll see you here again next week, Monday, same time, same place. And I hope you all have a great week. I'm looking forward to a great gardening week as well. See you then. And thanks for being here.